Dear brothers and sisters, that as we have rejoiced at the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, so by leave of God's mercy, we announce to you also the joy of his resurrection, who is our Savior. On the second day of March will fall Ash Wednesday, and the beginning of the fast of the most sacred Lenten season. On the seventeenth day of April, you will celebrate with joy Easter Day, the Paschal Feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the 29th day of May will be the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the 5th day of June, the Feast of Pentecost. On the 19th day of June, the Feast of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. On the 27th day of November, the first Sunday of the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom is honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What you just heard was the Epiphany Proclamation, a chanted a declaration of when all of the movable feasts throughout the year would be occurring, because as you all know, Easter occurs on different dates every year, and the whole rest of our calendar after uh, this feast is ordered around the, the dating of Easter, or, or pretty much so. Now, uh, this was, it might be, feel like a bit of an anachronism in our uh, day when we can pull up all of those dates uh, on our smartphones, uh, whip out the phone with a quick uh, typing, uh, you know, what is the date of Easter 2022, and we'll have it right there. So, so why this chanting? Well, the, the chant originated, of course, back in the days uh, before uh, the, the interwebs uh, made their advent uh, into the world, and so back then, I suppose, they might have had a little bit more uh, of a useful purpose, this proclamation. But even today, I think it can be great food for thought. And it can remind us uh, of, of an important fact, that information and knowledge do not equal wisdom. Today, we celebrate the day on which uh, the wise men who p possessed wisdom came from the East. And although they had wisdom, they had very little knowledge about what they pursued. Isn't that right? They showed up in the Holy Land and had to stop and ask, where is the newborn king of the Jews? They had wisdom. They knew how to seek him. They had seen the star rising, this kind of faint glimmer of an understanding that something somewhere was about to change in a great, great way. But who it was and where he was to be found, these things were beyond them. They certainly lacked knowledge. Now, other folks in this story had plenty of knowledge, or at least had access to it. The, the fusty old scribes that Herod went and asked uh, when and where the, the Messiah was to be born, they knew exactly where. Well, of course, five miles down the road in Bethlehem of Judea, as the prophet Malachi told us. Now, of course, then, though they lived their whole lives five miles from Bethlehem, Perhaps they had never made the walk, and they did not undertake that short journey for the first time when these magi from the east approached them. Herod, too, possessed all of the knowledge he needed as soon as he had spoken to these scribes of the people, and little did it profit him except for his damnation, because instead of responding in charity and joy, he responded with violence and hatred. And I'm afraid if we look at our own day, we will see likewise that our knowledge, sure, brings us some wonderful fruits, for example, our advances in medical science, and our knowledge, on the other hand, can bring us some pretty terrible disasters, for example, our knowledge of the functioning of the atom and the ability to manipulate that for, for very violent and nefarious purposes. Yes, knowledge is a two-edged sword, if you will. It cuts both ways. It's a kind of judgment, knowledge is. Whenever we come to know something, then we're called to make some sort of response. 
And that's where wisdom steps in, the knowledge of which response to choose and the ability to choose it when we come to knowledge. Today is the, called the Epiphany of the Lord. Uh, epiphany means manifestation. In the ancient world, it always referred to the manifestation of divine power. And the most famous epiphany we might see in the Old Testament uh, was the epiphany of the Most High God on Mount Sinai, with thunder and lightning, terrible omens and signs, and don't go too cl close or, God forbid, touch the mountain, because surely you will die. An epiphany always came with power, and it always came with judgment, because it always called for a human response. Now today, then, I think we're almost, it's supposed to be a kind of letdown, or, or, a, or an anticlimactic moment in this story. The tension and the climax have been building. We're told that these magi have been journeying from the Far East, probably the land of Persia, where they had been assiduously studying the stars, and great signs had appeared in the heavens. A new star had risen, and they journeyed hundreds, thousands perhaps of miles to make their way to the birth of this new king. They arrive in the royal city. They visit Herod's sumptuous palace. They speak with the learned men of Israel. And then they journey out to meet the king, and instead of finding him amidst power and splendor in the middle of the royal city, they find him in a small country village in the hovel of a working-class family. And when they approach the king, instead of seeing grandeur and power, we're told, and then they entered and saw a woman and her child. An anti-sign, almost. Instead of a revelation of glory and majesty and power, thunder and lightning, simply a woman and her child. And yet we call this the epiphany. And, and we're right. The book of Hebrews says the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing between joint and marrow, discerning thoughts and intentions of the heart. And did not this epiphany of the word of God reveal the thoughts and intentions of many hearts, the hearts of these humble, wise men who had journeyed so far on a difficult road from the east, the heart of the scribes who were too busy with their books to make the walk, the heart of Herod who cared only for himself and his power, and our hearts too, thousands of years later, because the Lord appears to us every day in a humble form as well, not as an infant in a manger, but as a wafer of bread on the altar. And as we approach him, the intentions of our heart are revealed, either reverence and homage before the King of Kings, or lackluster devotion, and hardly a heart moved at all. And so yes, Today, every Mass is an epiphany and a judgment in which the intentions of our hearts are revealed. And it's fitting that we reflect on the liturgy as we announced all of these feasts uh, of the liturgical year, because today we have, we celebrate the first act of Gentile worship of the King of all the nations. These men who are our